My beloved brothers and sisters. Nearly 16 million throughout the world revered President Thomas S. Monson as their prophet. He was uniquely brought up through the councils of the church as a young man. He will be remembered as a prophet to uh, move the church forward through his example. He learned wisdom from living prophets and increased in faith as he traveled the world seeking the saints. He possessed an innate ability to speak to all or to reach out to the one. The hallmark will be the individual concern. He taught through storytelling, true stories to which there was purpose, and to those who listened, a lesson about change, about doing more, about becoming a disciple of Christ. How do you think of the hymn, Have I Done Any Good in the World Today, without thinking of President Monson? I think that following the Spirit, a prompting to go do something or be with someone, is probably the single most startling and, and admirable characteristic in a very admirable life. It really is Thomas S. Monson. For nearly a decade, he led a people of faith through the world's challenges, tragedies, and moments of triumph. He has left a legacy for the church that will be of great blessing to all of us for decades to come. Now, as church members worldwide mourn his passing, they also celebrate his life, ministry, and legacy of service. God directs his prophet. My earnest prayer is that I might continue to be a worthy instrument in his hands, to carry on this great work, and to fulfill the tremendous responsibilities which come with the office of president. Thomas Spencer Monson became the 16th prophet and president of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on February 3, 2008. With this leader came all of the wisdom he had gleaned and learning he had experienced at the feet of other prophets who began teaching him as a young man. I think that President Monson's entire life has prepared him for the assignment. Living in the Pioneer Stake, he had Harold B. Lee as his stake president. And not only was Brother Lee a great example to him during that period of life, but he, Brother Lee went on to become the president of the church. President Monson also served as a mission president in Canada and was then called as an apostle at age 36. It is now proposed that we sustain the following. Thomas S. Monson. I pledge my life, all that I may have. I will strive to the utmost of my ability to be what you would want me to be. He has been tutored and schooled by some of the great prophets of this dispensation. He's been surrounded by apostles that have been senior to him, that have taught him. They always gave him a, a kind of uh, perspective when everyone wanted to change something or, you know, let's, let's change this. He'd say, well, remember, uh, this has worked for a long time. And he had a long experience of what worked and what didn't work in the church, both for individuals and for organizations. In 2009, President Monson presided over the dedication and opening of the new Church History Library. The church today is as committed as it ever was to preserving its history and making it available to scholars and to the public. This was a moment of personal history for the president. He spoke those words from the same pulpit where he stood as a young bishop of the 6th, 7th Ward in Salt Lake City at age 22. The ward included 1,080 members and many were widows. It wasn't until recently I learned what a sacrifice or how much time that actually took with my father visiting all those widows. Because it's not as if you just show up at the door and hand over the gift. No, you're invited in and you get to sit down and you share experiences and remembrances together. That five-year period he served as bishop became a defining moment for him. 
Another defining period in his life came when he received the assignment as an apostle to visit East Germany. It needed a lot of nurture and a lot of care because there was a, a despotic hand that, that reigned there and the people were oppressed and the ideals of conscience and freedom and, and the privilege of worshiping as one might choose, all those were swept off the table under the communist rule. And President Monson fearlessly found himself in the middle of those circumstances and did all that he could to ensure that the light of truth was preserved. President Monson prayed for all of the German people, but often he would learn of individual needs. He saw that these saints lived with very little. He even noticed the condition of their clothes. He'd go with a suitcase full of clothes and come home in a pair of trousers and one time in his slippers because he was even giving the clothes off his back. But what he was really giving them was hope and exemplifying faith that the Lord knew they were there and that everything would come together, and it did. After years of building bridges with East German government leaders, President Monson experienced one of the happiest days of his life, the dedication of the Freiburg Temple, the first in a communist country, the first on German soil. It's not a large temple but it's a miracle every step of the way. It was timely, and the Lord's will was done. Through his openness, his honesty, his uh, wonderful way of, of dealing with people, regardless from where they came, uh, opened the doors, and uh, they trusted him. And so the temple was built there, and it was a blessing that he had many years before promised to the people in East Germany uh, that these blessings will come at a time when no one would have ever thought that this would be possible. That period to receive permission to build the Freiberg Temple stretched over 20 years. President Monson always believed that more faith would open doors still closed. In 2000, he placed a piece of the Berlin Wall into the Sunday School sesquicentennial time capsule. And we watched as the darkness of tyranny gave way to the light of the truth and freedom, the blessed bells of freedom, rang a new millennium for the people of that area. Spreading light and truth everywhere he went, those who served with him say President Monson also possessed a spirit of great optimism. He was uniquely prepared to assume leadership position in the church as prophet. It seems to me in the sense that he had not been steeped in lots and lots of church government or lots of callings because there hadn't been time. And yet when you look back I and mean, when you see the flow of his ministry, when you look back at him, I think you see that, well, the preparation was exactly what it needed to be. Now, I don't imagine that when President Monson was selling advertising for Deseret News Publishing Company, that he had the notion that one day he would be sharing the words of God across the breadth of the earth. But that was preparatory to now what has become a blessing to the entire world. Stated simply, if we do not have a deep foundation of faith and a solid testimony of truth, we may have difficulty withstanding the harsh storms and icy winds of adversity, which inevitably come to each of us. The words of a prophet. President Thomas S. Monson knew who he was. That foundation of faith came from loving parents who taught by example. From the time that he was born into a family that exposed him to the um, challenges that people had in their lives and the way to address them, that experience carried through in his ministry as a bishop and subsequently as a mission president and, and as an apostle and as the president of the church. Gladys and Spencer Monson welcomed their son Tommy to the world on August 21st, 1927. As a boy, he saw the results of acts of kindness. He was there as his father cared for aging aunts and uncles, as his mother fed transients, and as his grandfather provided a home for an old friend. 
Those who knew President Monson will tell you that he never forgot lessons learned as a child. He told the story of his mother buying a train set for a less fortunate boy down the street, but Tommy wanted one of the cars. She let him take it, but he soon realized he shouldn't have done that and delivered it to the boy. If one listens to the stories that President Monson shares, one comes to realize this isn't just storytelling. This is painting a mosaic of how Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ prepare a prophet. He was graduated from West High School, and the man with the name tag, Tommy, was always a favorite at reunions for the class of 44. When I came home from my mission in England, uh, I met Tom Monson, President Monson, at my father's dealership. Now, he was in the automobile business, and President Monson was with Deseret News. And he was 22 years old and I was 21. So we've known each other for 62 years. And all I know about him is good. He's just one of those kind of Renaissance people that come by, by once in a while. He captured the love of the community. There was another important moment in Tom Monson's life when he met the beautiful Frances Beverly Johnson at the University of Utah's Hello Day dance. She danced with another date, but he got an introduction weeks later at the bus stop. Sister Monson described the first time her parents met him at a BYU women's conference. She told the audience that her father showed Thomas Monson a picture of a young missionary also with the last name of Monson and asked, do you know him? President Monson said, yes, that is my grandfather. My uh, father was just thrilled. He thought, oh, we knew him. He was a missionary in our home in Sweden and helped convert my mother and father and 12 children. By that time, he was in, so. <laughs> he married Francis in October of 1948. Through the years, I've seen how my father has always asked for her opinion, has valued what she has shared, and then has used what she has given him in counsel, in the decisions that he's made, in the service he's provided, and so he has treasured that association. They've solved problems together, they've had disappointments, and that is part of this mortal experience and they've just been patient in working together. Through their early married years of raising their three children and him serving in important church callings, she was always there for all of them. I remember uh, reading an account of a newscaster asking her the question, how do you deal with the fact that you've got this young family and he's always gone and you're on your own? And she looked at him and she said, well, I've learned to stand on my own two feet. You go to Little America with them and they order a milkshake and they share their chocolate milkshake. It's really a truly tender love story that to sit and watch them together, you just say, this is what it's all about. I thank my Father in heaven for my sweet companion, Francis. Beginning when I was called as a bishop at the age of 22, we've seldom had the luxury of sitting together during a church service. I could not have asked for a more loyal, loving, and understanding companion. During General Conference 2010, President Monson thanked everyone for their concerns about Sister Monson, who fell and broke her hip and shoulder the previous fall. She's doing well and continues to make progress toward a full recovery. In fact, at the last minute, she said, I'm going today. You can't keep one of these Swedish girls down, I'll tell you. Sister Monson passed away a few years later in May of 2013. During General Conference that fall, President Monson spoke openly about the pain of losing her. She was the love of my life, my trusted confidant, and my closest friend. To say that I miss her does not begin to convey the depth of my feelings. 
Keenly aware of the sacred sorrow of death, President Monson mourned often with those who mourned. He went to more funerals. In fact, there'd be weeks when I'd, he'd do two or three funerals, and they would be people uh, that he uh, knew only vaguely or just a little bit of, but he went as if they were dear friends. Former Relief Society General President Linda K. Burton recalled how President Monson reached out to her soon after her father passed away. Well, I get this phone call asking, I think it was from Sweet Ann Dib, his daughter, if it would be all right if he could come and visit my mom. And she had actually had called shortly after the passing of my dad and had apologized <clears throat> that President Monson wouldn't be able to be there at the funeral for my dad because uh, his cousin had passed away and he had the funeral at the same time and he was speaking at that funeral. I thought he didn't owe that to me at all. And yet he had her reach out so to make up for that, he wanted to go visit my mom in person. President Monson made everyone he came in contact with feel that he or she mattered. He's committed to this idea of following a prompting and, it, and the focus is almost always one person. It's seldom ever a big deal, a big group or whatever. It's some little soul out there, a, a, a man or a woman or a child or a widow or, or, or somebody. We are the Lord's hands here upon the earth with a mandate to serve and to lift His children. He is dependent upon each of us. On that conference weekend in 2009, President Monson then said that on his birthday, a reporter had asked him, what is the ideal gift? I replied, find someone who's having a hard time or is ill or lonely and do something for him or her. When he turned 90 in August 2016, President Monson made the same birthday request. It'd be interesting to know, and we'll never know, how many people's lives have been affected and changed because they themselves said, you know, President Monson, the prophet, has asked me to um, rescue those who need of rescue. President Monson's biography was titled To the Rescue, because he always tried to do just that, reach out and rescue those in need. Time off, holidays, vacations, they never um, amended his desire to assist those in need. And he instilled in all of us the same desire. We are surrounded by those in need of our attention, our encouragement, our support, our comfort, our kindness. He demonstrated that natural kindness when, as he left the conference center, he helped one little boy with his coat and held hands with another as they talked. In his words and in his actions, President Monson told us we can all do better because there is always someone who needs help. Used often the phrase, how would you like to paint a bright spot upon your soul? Those of us who know him um, know very well that that is an invitation to do something good. He is a absolute obedient servant to the Spirit. If President Monson has a prompting that somebody needs him or he's to do something, he doesn't argue, he just gets up and does it. And he's always right. Elder Ballard, like President Monson, served as mission president in Toronto, Canada. I got a phone call from him telling me that he was sending a missionary to the Canada-Toronto Mission that had a serious health issue. Here the missionary's application comes, President Monson sees it, knows the father, knows that there's a problem, and knows that there's a good hospital in Toronto, so he assigns him to me to see that he's taken care of. We did use that hospital, and we did have fasting and prayer, both in the missionaries and his family. He did finish his mission, and he's, he was cured, and he's now the father of uh, six children and has served as a bishop. President Monson visited those who were sick or suffering in healthcare centers and hospitals for decades. Sometimes it wasn't only the patient who needed his help. He looked at him and he said, I'm Tom Monson. Is there anything I can do to help? And the man looks at him and he says, oh, yes. He says, my grandson's here and I need to give him a blessing, but 
my son does not hold the Melchizedek priesthood and would you help me? And he says, well, yes, let's go. So he goes down, gives this young boy a blessing, but before he does, he says to the father, come and stand over here right next to me so you can hear how I do this so that next time you'll be ready to give this blessing to your child. So he blesses him and then goes out in the hall, nine more children before he gets back to the elevator. The hallmark will be the individual concern, like the Savior going out to the, the poor, the sick, whoever. Always mindful of those in need, President Monson was also a loyal friend. He manages to make everybody feel that uh, you're his best friend, you're, you're, you're his uh, bride and joy. And that, that's another element. I, let me insert that while we're talking about him. Um, loyalty is one of the remarkable qualities in Thomas Monson's life, and it's spoken or unspoken what he expects from other people. When you're, when you're Tom Monson's friend, you're his friend forever. Even after they moved, President and Sister Monson kept in touch with friends in the Salt Lake neighborhood where they lived with their family for decades. A number of years ago, I received the assignment to home teach the Monsons. And in talking with my bishop, I said, you want me to home teach President and Sister Monson? And his response to me was, well, yeah. <laughs> so with a little bit of anxiety, I went to the Monsons' home and they willingly invited us in and immediately put us at ease. And since that time, President and Sister Monson have been so accepting, so welcoming, so loving, so kind and have become such wonderful and dear and great friends. At first, their son accompanied him to home teach the Monsons, then other young men. I remember one time I was there with a priest who's my companion preparing to go on a mission. And this priest had prepared the lesson for that evening and he gave the lesson and, and as you can imagine, it was you know, pretty much from the magazine that he was reading through and he got all done, President Monson looked at me and looked at him and he goes, yeah, Phil, that's from a talk I gave at Rick's College back in 1997 and he <laughs> winks at me. <laughs> that service to which all of us have been called is the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. As he enlists us to his cause, he invites us to draw close to him. Many areas of the world have experienced difficult economic times. Businesses have failed, jobs have been lost, and investments have been jeopardized. We must make certain that those for whom we share responsibility do not go hungry or unclothed or unsheltered. The LDS Church's humanitarian program began more than 30 years ago, and President Monson was personally involved in many efforts. He said, Keith, this is Tom Monson. I have been looking at the reports on the news, and I see that the food bank is in desperate need of help. Don't you think we could provide some assistance out of our surplus? Couldn't we get a truckload of goods over there? It is, after all, Christmas. And of course, we responded immediately. We express profound gratitude to all of you for your willingness to assist with our humanitarian efforts by sharing your resources, and in many cases, your time, your talents, and your expertise. Under President Monson's direction, the welfare and humanitarian work of the church received a huge boost. This 570,000 square foot Bishop's Central Storehouse on Salt Lake's west side opened in January of 2012. The commodities are in this facility are shipped worldwide. Uh, we have 110 storehouses in the United States and Canada, 100 home storage centers, and then internationally, we have shipped before into about 165 different countries. From earthquakes to fires to floods, Latter-day Saints have followed President Monson's example of coming to the rescue. President Henry B. Eyring spoke of that example during October 2017 General Conference. I have heard a report that some have started calling the Latter-day Saints 
who are wearing yellow helping hand t-shirts, the yellow angels. Each time there is a tragic event anywhere in the world, Latter-day Saints will donate and volunteer to the church's humanitarian efforts. An appeal is seldom needed. In 2015, the First Presidency sent a letter signed by President Monson and his counselors encouraging Latter-day Saints to provide assistance to refugees around the world. Each of us came to earth having been given the light of Christ as we follow the example of the Savior and live as he lived and as he taught, that light will burn within us and will light the way of others. Within the LDS Church, President Monson was an advocate for the role of the bishop in caring for the less fortunate. He that desire the office of a bishop desireth a good work. I think today those of us who are here could say, he that desire the office of a bishop desireth a good workout, and we would be accurate. As a bishop, apostle, and prophet, President Monson was always at the helm, guiding, distributing, and nurturing the church's welfare efforts. As you and I go to the holy houses of God, as we remember the covenants we make within, we will be more able to bear every trial and to overcome each temptation. In this sacred sanctuary, we will find peace. We will be renewed and fortified. As an apostle and prophet, President Monson dedicated 21 temples and rededicated another five temples in cities all over the world. The building and dedicating of temples initiated under President Hinckley and carried on with vigor under President Monson. That is another example of a bold leadership. President Monson traveled through thick fog to dedicate his first temple as church president in Rexburg, Idaho in February 2008. It's beautiful and it's a great blessing to them. I had the opportunity to be in the celestial room with President Monson and it was just the most beautiful experience that I have ever had. From fog to a torrential downpour in Panama City to dedicate a temple that makes an international statement because it is visible to all ships that pass through the Panama Canal. I'm happy to see the little children here. They will remember this day forever in their lives. That same month, President Monson traveled to Twin Falls, Idaho to dedicate the fourth temple in that state. We'll go in and see if we can dedicate this house. Right now it's yours and mine and all the church, but in a few minutes it'll belong to the Lord. Good morning, Daryl, how are you? Fine, sir, how are you? I'm well, good to see you here, dear. Good to see you too. <laughs> Isn't this a beautiful spot for a temple? We tell not the Lord nor his goodness. A choir of 200 young people from Sandy and Draper sang for the Draper Temple cornerstone ceiling in March of 2009. President Monson greeted the crowd as he arrived to dedicate the new Okra Mountain Temple in South Jordan. It's a beautiful day beautiful day. And now it will be my opportunity to place the mortar within the stone. Uh, I'm not a professional, and to prove that to you, all you need to do is look at my work, and then we're going to call on some of you to assist. Dozens of children quietly hoped to be chosen. I think that boy in a suit with a tie. Come on up. See, all those people are watching you. <laughs> Go over here. He'll tell you, show you what to do. When I saw President Monson, the spirit just washed over me, and it felt really, really good. <laughs> I didn't expect this, but thank you so much. That's for Montreal. Thank you. That's for Toronto. I'll go back. On his way into the Vancouver Temple, President Monson greeted an old friend from his days as mission president in Canada. After church leaders started the sealing of the cornerstone, children added some mortar as well. well I helped the um, president of the church put in the cornerstone of the Vancouver Temple. And how did that feel? It's, like it was, like it wasn't even real. 
President Monson greeted dozens of young people as he arrived for the Gila Valley, Arizona temple dedication. This was the first temple he announced when he became church president. President Monson traveled to Kiev, Ukraine in August of 2010 to dedicate the first temple in the former Soviet Union. Now we look forward to the dedication. Зараз ми з нетерпінням очікуємо на освячення. It will the day you will ever remember. It's a, a day of freedom. A new day dawned in northwestern Missouri on the day of the Kansas City Temple dedication. Hello, kids. How are you doing? Early church members suffered persecution here and in 1838 were driven out of Missouri after the governor signed an extermination order. This temple, built to connect generations, also honors those pioneers. Whether a temple is close to church headquarters or halfway around the world, the idea is to place them within reach of Latter-day Saints. President Monson believed that if they will attend often, they will feel the power of the Spirit in their lives day after day. I don't think it ever was the idea that he was, a, he thought of himself as a great temple uh, builder. It was that he saw the blessing of having temples everywhere and he wanted it for the people. Again, it was like his feeling for the people, uh, which he had so deeply. It was, he wanted to have as many people in as many places where they could have the blessings of the temple. Few groundbreakings in the faith have generated as much excitement as the one for the Rome, Italy temple. He has faith that this is the Lord's work and there will be a way. And so he announces a temple in Rome. I mean, it's just miraculous. President Monson shared his feelings with church members at General Conference in April of 2011. A city where the ancient apostles Peter and Paul preached the gospel of Christ and where each was martyred. A choir welcomed President Monson as he presided over his last temple dedication in Phoenix, Arizona. Once again, he took time to visit with some children in the crowd. Ashlyn Hurst from Surprise, Arizona, said it was a special moment, especially for her daughters. Oh, I hope it's a, an experience they'll never forget. They got to say hello and give a high five to President Monson and President Uchtdorf. President Monson said the opportunity to dedicate and rededicate temples was among the most enjoyable and sacred of his blessings. As we stand the temple, there could come to us a dimension of spirituality and a feeling of peace, which will transcend any other feeling which could come into the human heart. President Monson's imprint is visible on all church programs and businesses. He was the final bridge to a vital moment in church history. The long promised day has come when every faithful, worthy man in the church may receive the holy priesthood. As the last man alive who was present in June 1978 when church leaders received the revelation giving the priesthood to all worthy men, he was one of three apostles who President Spencer W. Kimball asked to write opinions on the issue. All in favor, please signify by raising your right hands. He performed the first sealing for a black family in a Latter-day Saint temple and attended the first Genesis group meeting where the sacrament was served, administered, and passed by black members with the priesthood. That's something that had been hoped for and longed for for decades, but I thought it wouldn't happen in my lifetime. So <laughs> the first part was surprise. President Monson also served as chairman of the Scriptures Publications Committee and contributed greatly to the printing of the 1979 LDS edition of the King James Bible and the 1981 edition of the Triple Combination. He had a rich background, of course, in publishing. And when one reads the scriptures, one sees the words printing, the word printing appearing often, and declaring things or sharing things to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. It was a fascinating experience to be dealing with someone who was a respected church leader, but he was an old printing guy. He knew printing, he knew publishing, He'd pull out his piker ruler, and we would talk about everything from the size of the margins in the books to the, I mean, he could finger the paper and tell you, oh, this is about a 50 pound something or other. It's just, it was, it was very fun. Under President Monson's direction, 
the church significantly increased its digital presence. Take some of the wonderful campaigns that have happened at Christmas time and Easter time uh, that have been sponsored by the church, often by the missionary department, uh, the Light the World campaign and other things. All of that has come forward under his direction and focus and his leadership. One announcement made here in the conference center changed the direction of thousands of young lives. In fact, because of what President Monson said, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints fundamentally changed. Able young man who graduated from high school or his equivalent, regardless of where they live, will have the option of being recommended for missionary service beginning at the age of 18 that able, worthy young women who have the desire to serve may be recommended for missionary service beginning at age 19. The excitement was tangible. The response to President Monson's announcement has been unlike anything I've ever observed, ever. So to find out that I could go right now to do something that I've wanted to do for my whole life was so exciting. Young people responded. At the time when President Monson made the announcement in October 2012, the church had 58,500 missionaries. The number skyrocketed over coming months by about 50%, peaking at almost 90,000. I'm going to the Belgium, Netherlands Dutch speaking mission. Canada, Toronto mission. Nauvoo, Illinois. Australia, Melbourne. The Baltic mission. Young women stepped forward in greater numbers than ever. In 2014, there was about a 175% increase in the number of sisters serving in the church's 406 missions. Everyone was kind of, oh, when the young men were announced that their age eligibility was now 18. But then when he said for the women, the sisters could, could now serve at 19, it was just this, Wow! And it has continued to be a wow experience with those that are serving. The Provo Missionary Training Center expanded to accommodate the influx of missionaries and other missionary training centers opened around the world. So you see just this steady acceleration and this march of the church going forward. It's been remarkable. In 2013, the church began publishing in-depth essays about topics of special public interest in church history and doctrine approved by the First Presidency. The subjects included polygamy and the past restriction on blacks and the priesthood. That same year, the First Presidency announced that a semi-annual general women's session would become part of general conference. Then in 2017 announced that both the general priesthood and general women's sessions of general conference would be held annually. In all these decisions, whether great or small, and there were a lot of great decisions he had to make, uh, he was relying on the Lord. He was always trusting the Lord. He always said, don't trust on your own, don't lean on your own understandings, trust the Lord. And then he was very open in including his counselors, including the 12, in all important decisions. We're a global church. Our membership is found throughout the world. May we be good citizens of the nations in which we live and good neighbors in our communities, reaching out to those of other faiths as well as to those of our own. If the food pantry shelves were empty, President Monson made sure they were filled, even if it was Christmas Eve. If the Cathedral of the Madeline's Good Samaritan program needed sandwiches for its sack lunches, he made sure the food was there. So many times I've heard you say, we can't let the hungry stay hungry, the homeless homeless, or those without clothing naked. We have to do everything we can together to help those people, and so you have. And the helping hand was one of friendship and it was personal for President Monson. President Monson is fascinating because he's had ties with the Jewish community in Utah, dating back to his um, early years, and he's really been a friend. This photograph is in President Monson's biography. He sat with the rabbi at Governor John Huntsman's second inauguration. 
I think that President Monson's presence in this community is somebody who, similarly to President Hinckley, is a bridge builder and somebody who wants to make sure that religion in general, a godly feeling in Utah, should be something that is strongly felt and that it radiates throughout the entire state. Interfaith cooperation often focused on those in need. Many in Utah saw President Monson as the man who would always help. I see him as a man of God. I see him as following the scriptures. I think because he is a man of God, that in many ways his actions and decisions epitomize the teachings of Christ. Reaching out included world leaders. Thomas S. Monson took his faith and friendly approach from prime ministers to presidents. President Monson and Elder Dallin Oaks presented President Barack Obama with five leather-bound volumes of his family history. In 1998, the Catholic community honored President and Sister Monson for their service. I don't think God is too particular about the creeds of this person or that person when it comes down to caring for the sick and comforting the lonely and giving them hope in a better life. I think the world of all with whom I've met at St. Joseph. He believed in recognizing goodness in others and in turn, they did the same for him. Uh, two years ago, I had got a taxi in London from one uh, side of London to the other to get to a different rail station. And the taxi driver found out I was from um, Utah and asked me the usual question. And it was obvious he didn't know anything about Mormonism. And so I spent 20, 25 minutes educating this, this man. And I felt at the end as though I was a missionary for the Mormon church. But one of the thoughts that occurred to me was, I think President Monson would have been very proud of me. President Monson attended the installation of Bishop John C. Wester as he became the leader of Utah's Catholics. And he accepted the invitation to speak as the diocese celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Cathedral of the Madeline. For many, many decades, you've been a real friend of our Catholic Church and we'll never be able to thank you enough. So many times you've come to our assistance, you've supported us, particularly in our works of charity. You've been there with us shoulder to shoulder, discovering ways that you and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints could be a support to us in our work for others. I pray for you and Francis and your whole family. I pray that uh, you will feel our love and our support for you. You are a man of deep faith, of profound compassion and genuine warmth and real joy. We really think the world of you, President Monson. President Monson's attitude of service earned him the Worldwide Humanitarian Award in 2007. He also received nearly every award there is in scouting, including International Scouting's highest award, the Bronze Wolf. President Monson personifies the Scout Oath. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God. And if that's not Tom Monson, I don't know what is. In 2016, a new Boy Scout Lodge in Wyoming was named in honor of President Monson. The lodge sits on the Hinckley Scout Ranch at the East Fork of the Bear River. His name is also on the Thomas S. Monson Leadership Excellence Complex at the Summit Bechtel Reserve in West Virginia. And yet, some might say his favorite award was his pigeon raising merit badge from his youth that is no longer offered. President Monson has never forgiven the Boy Scouts of America for getting rid of pigeon raising merit badge. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a thing with him. President Monson continued his pigeon hobby, but his dedication to scouting ran much deeper. Scouting teaches boys how to live, not merely how to make a living. Like many other church leaders before him, President Monson felt the teachings of the church and scouting values went hand in hand. I believe in scouting. I believe in the goals of the organization. I believe in the power of scouting to bless and enrich lives for good. He has a vision that is much the same as Baden Powell's was, and that is Baden Powell's was never just to teach boys scouting skills, but it was to teach character. Former Young Men General President Charles Dahlquist accompanied President Monson to many scout jamborees. He can go through a sea of bodies and be able to pick out the one. 
and to be able to kneel down and to be able to talk to a child or to a, a young man or a young woman and it makes all the difference not only in their lives but in the lives of those that, uh, that are with them. I don't know anybody who is more one-on-one -on -one oriented than President Monson is. Add in trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean and reverent, and perhaps you get to the core of President Thomas S. Monson. Is there a way to safety? Is there an escape from threatened destruction? The answer is a resounding yes. I counsel you to look to the lighthouse of the Lord. For more than five decades, President Monson preached, counseled, and bore witness of Jesus Christ during General Conference. Those messages always touched hearts. He was not a man with, with dark feelings of the future. He was a positive man. He had hope in the future. He trusted God and, and you know, he would help us and direct us and, and give us uh, the right direction to solve the challenge which are ahead. And always with these challenges, he's, he always saw there were great opportunities and beautiful things ahead of us. With a background in publishing, President Monson was a gifted writer and speaker. He's really uh, poetic uh, in his, uh, in his uh, style, in his uh, writing style, and therefore his, his oratory. Uh, he's enthusiastic. He has that larger-than-life, robust spirit. His spirit's as big as his body, uh, and it, it comes out. President Monson ha had a joie de vivre about life. He loved life. You see the fun things he liked to do, everything from wiggle his ears, uh, anywhere from a, a stake center a rostrum to the conference center pulpit. But then he just had a jovial, um, kind of larger than life personality. I decided to put him to the test. <laughs> I looked squarely at him. Certain I had his attention. And then I wiggled my ears. <laughs> my wife told me not to say that. <laughs> he made a vain attempt to do the same. But I had him. <laughs> he prepares uh, precisely. Uh, back in the old days, before teleprompters, he memorized. Uh, so he, he had every word. He knew exactly what he wanted to say. Uh, and that's kind of a requirement in these days of timed television components. But, but he seemed to do it better than anybody else. Uh, and the memorization was, it was just dramatic. I mean, it was, uh, it was very impressive. In this digital age when people are quick to click on the next new thing, President Monson recognized that hearing and experiencing things over and over is the way great change takes place. President Monson's determination to share the truths of life as he experienced them um, has been a blessing to everyone in the church because they have not been able to um, ignore the stories. They have been enriched by them and they've had the opportunity to hear them a number of times. And in so hearing, there comes a, 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 a deeper understanding. The word widow had a special connotation to our Lord. He cautioned his disciples against the example of the scribes who feigned righteousness by their lengthy apparel, their long prayers, but who devoured the houses of widows. President Monson's most frequent message to followers of Jesus Christ, help those in need, do good. He's fond of quoting uh, that uh, Jesus went about doing good. That was a favorite line of his. I remember him using it at David Haight's funeral. And, 
Uh, yeah, I think that's what he'd expect from members of the church is um, go do this. And not because he does it, not because Thomas Monson does it, but because the Savior did, because uh, that is the example of uh, Christ-like love. That is the, the real meaning of charity. And uh, charity would be a kind of a synonym, compassion would be a synonym for uh, the life that uh, Thomas Monson led. Amidst the storms of life, danger lurks, and men like boats find themselves stranded and facing destruction. Who will man the lifeboats, leaving behind the comforts of home and family, and go to the rescue? It may appear to you at times that those out in the world are having much more fun than you are. Some of you may be, feel restricted by the code of conduct to which we and the church adhere. My brothers and sisters, I declare to you, however, there is nothing which can bring more joy into our lives or more peace to our souls than the Spirit which can come to us as we follow the Savior, and keep the commandments. President Monson had hope in the future. He spoke often of faith, not fear. But he said that kind of peace comes by standing with the Savior. That faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is not just for personal expressions and, and personal hope, but it's for an entire nation and an entire world. You just see him willing to step out and take us with him because he has such faith for the future. And that future, President Monson said, rests with the next generation, the young men and young women of the church. He recognizes that many of these youth are standing alone in doing that which is right. But when they stand alone with the Lord, with the Holy Ghost as their constant companion, they really are not alone and the blessing they'll gain is confidence. President Monson loves the youth. He relates to them. He's a scouter. I mean, he's carried the flag for scouting and, and, and a national level. And um, because he loves the youth, they love him. In 2012, President Monson told the young women he understands how difficult the teenage years are but he has confidence in them. You are precious, precious daughters of our Heavenly Father, sent to earth at this day and time for a purpose. You've been withheld until this very hour. Wonderful, glorious things are in store for you if you will only believe, obey, and endure. I like uh, President Monson, how he said, believe, obey, and endure. I really liked when President Monson said every Cinderella has a, her midnight. In 2011, students began lining up to get a seat in the Marriott Center at 3 a.m. when they learned President Monson would speak. Ours is the responsibility to keep our lights aflame and burning brightly that they might shine for others to see and follow. I think the Lord you know, prepared him to be the prophet at this time, and he knows what we need, and the Lord knows what we need. The young men and young women of the faith understood that President Monson was speaking to them. My young friends, be strong. The philosophies of men surround us. The face of sin today often wears the Halloween mask of tolerance. Do not be deceived. Behind that facade is heartache unhappiness and pain. You know what is right. President Monson asked the young people to walk with the Holy Spirit and to make Jesus Christ the center of their lives every day. With all my heart and the fervency of my soul, I lift up my voice in testimony today as a special witness and declare that God does live Jesus is his son, the only begotten of the Father in the flesh. He is our redeemer. He is our mediator with the Father. He loves us with a love we cannot fully comprehend. 
And because he loves us, he gave his life for us. Beloved son, husband, and father, prophet and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, President Thomas S. Monson lived a life that exemplified all that he believed. Some of the things I've seen, some of us may look to a prophet and think, well, of course a prophet can do those things. But this is what he's been doing his entire life. It's what has been, was modeled for him by his parents and family and other examples that were prominent in his life. He's always looked to the Savior as the perfect example. Wherever he was, he served. That was the moment was life for him and it was service to God and fellow man. So I think what, what I learned from him, uh, from my friends, uh, President Monson, who I will miss forever, because uh, his example showed me, use the moment, enjoy the journey, and do what you can at that moment, and the Lord will bless you. I think that following the Spirit, a prompting to go do something or be with someone, is probably the single most startling and, and admirable characteristic in a very admirable life. It really is Thomas S. Monson. Some of the hallmarks of his uh, service was that he, he knew from experience how to give counsel in almost every situation that would run into in the church. He told stories, he told them very well, and I think that that was partly the way he would take time with somebody to mentor them and to teach them about experiences that he had had. So I will always think about his generosity of spirit and his willing to teach anybody who walked into his office, regardless of what they walked in for. I think that's quite a, an astonishing spiritual gift, really. President Thomas S. Monson is a wonderful prophet of God. He has left a legacy for the church that will be of great blessing to all of us for decades to come. His life is a living sermon of devotion to God and to His holy work. And I am the great, one of the great beneficiaries of His marvelous ministry. We can't think of President Monson without thinking of the scripture that he always would turn to. Part in Covenants 84, 88. You know, I will go before your face. My angels will be on your right hand and on your left, and my spirit will be in your heart, and my angels round about you to bear, bear you up. I don't think anyone has typified that and trusted in that more than, the, than our beloved President Watson. May we live so that when that final summons is heard, we may have no serious regrets, no unfinished business, but we'll be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Amen.